Yeah, good morning also to everyone from my side. Um, happy to host you for the second monthly start pitch of 2021 uh, for February. Um, I will also just like two minutes about BlockRocket and what we do, and then I will quickly explain the agenda today and introduce you to the startups and to the jury. So um, yeah, quickly about us. So we are BlockRocket. We are an early stage um, startup uh, accelerator for um, blockchain startups, uh, mostly active in the German ecosystem. So what we do is we, um, uh, invest up to 150,000 euros in startups. So we focus on pre-seed and seed startups. So valuations usually ranging from one to 5 million. Um, and we offer a program to start as well, like uh, in terms of matchmaking, uh, help them with marketing, business development, um, also get a bit quick and dirty, uh, especially in the first days, uh, as we have worked with a lot of startups uh, in the early days and um, have a lot of learnings from that. Um, we Our program exists since um, roughly two years, but we have grown quite quickly since then. So. Um, we have more than 150 applications, um, more than 50 startups on our shortlist. Um, we have invested more into, uh, in, into five startups within the last six months. As I said, uh, ticket sizes usually are around 100, 150,000 euros. Um, we're in contact with uh, the, the biggest VCs uh, that are in, in context of blockchain, uh, in Germany at least, um, and acquired numerous partnerships. Um, quick overview of the partners or companies um, that we're talking to. Um, so it's ranging from uh, blockchain infrastructure providers to tech legal consultancies, uh, investors, VCs, corporates, etc. So we're quite in a, a nice position for blockchain uh, enthusiasts or any any company that's related to blockchain to uh, do matchmaking and make introductions. Um, we have a multi-stage application process, so um, it takes roughly four to six weeks to go from point A to to point F. Um, and within, within that time frame with uh, different touch points, we um, decide if we uh, invest into a startup or not. Um, this application process is like roughly divided into two different categories. So something that we call shortlist. So it's basically all the startups that are in a closer selection or startups that we are eyeballing uh, more intensively over the course of a few weeks. And uh, we have a program, so startups that we invest in and startups are part of a program. And at this point, we have uh, seven startups to be precise, a part of the program. Five of them we uh, also invested ourselves. So that's a very quick overview. Um, uh, that's me and my team. So if you are interested, so if you're a startup, if you know the, uh, the next big thing in terms of blockchain, or you know uh, some friends of yours are still sitting in the garage with a good idea, then uh, feel free to uh, point them towards us. It's highly appreciated. Otherwise, if you're a corporate, a bank, a VC, and you're just interested into blockchain, uh, more to get in touch with what's the newest uh, blockchain uh, pl projects, then also feel uh, free to reach out to us. We're always happy to talk and happy to collaborate. Okay, so far so good from my side. Um, so quickly about the agenda today. So we have four startups, four blockchain startups, uh, all early stage. Um, they have uh, five to six minutes for pitching each. And we invited a jury of uh, three jury members from VCs. Um, that uh, will lead a Q&A section with each startup for around six to seven minutes. And when the whole um, event is finished, at the very end, we do like a small voting. So basically something that we call like a monthly favorite. And uh, the jury, uh, the jury uh, is going to vote. And um, the audience is also going to vote with a live function, like a poll function through Zoom. And we make a 50-50 division in the end. So 50% of the vote is from the audience, 50% is from the jury. And then we announce um, who was the monthly favorite for the event today. Um, so I would like to quickly um, hand over to the jury so they can introduce themselves. And then after we will start with the first startup right away. So first of all, I would like to um, hand over to uh, Janis from uh, Blockwall. Janis, can you say a few words about yourself? Sure. Thanks a lot for uh, introducing um, uh, the event. Uh, Jan is my name. I'm a co-founder of Blockwall. We are a German-based venture capital fund and dedicated to early stage ventures. We have one fund running, which was um, only investing into um, protocols or infrastructure investments, while our second fund dedicated to equity investments, early stage um, pre-seed seed. Um, they should have a European focus, which is very uh, important to us and of course, blockchain angle needs to be clear, crystal clear by blockchain is a key component in the business model. I'm happy to be part as a very member today. Awesome. Thanks for being here today. Then the second would be Marcel from uh, Freigeist Capital. Hi, everyone. I'm Marcel. I'm working at um, Freigeist. We are focused on 
in a broader sense, uh, we, we call it deep tech startups. So that are startups uh, where the core value lies in the technology of these startups. Uh, we are not afraid to invest in hardware startups, but also invested in some software startups. Haven't invested so much in um, blockchain startups so far. So our only investment in the um, ELT ecosystem is Neufund Fund so far. And we are focusing on two investments per year. So very uh, limited amount of investments and very heavily support on the operational side by us. Thank you, Marcel. And uh, lastly, we have Manuel from uh, Signature Ventures. Yeah, thanks, Benjamin. Um, um, Manuel, a principal with uh, Signature Ventures. Uh, we're basically a, a seed stage uh, venture fund uh, based out of Munich uh, and Berlin. Um, we invest in projects and, and also startups that build or build on top of public blockchains and, and protocols and so far, we've made five investments uh, across uh, the global uh, blockchain ecosystem. All right, fantastic. Then uh, thank you guys. Uh, and I would say let's uh, switch to the first presentation for today, which is uh, Maria from uh, Ibiza. Maria, can you, can you hear us? Yes, let me fantastic. screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, screen sharing works. Okay, so let's start. Fantastic, stage is yours. <laughs> so hello everyone, uh, my name is Maria and I'm a co-founder of Ibiza. It is a pleasure to be here today and have the opportunity to share with you uh, our journey. Oops. And it starts with the 500 million farmers that feed all of us and yet don't have access to insurance and are exposed to weather related risks. Traditional insurance have not penetrated this market efficiently due to cost structure problems that make micro insurance not viable for them. However, the agriculture insurance for smallholders alone represents a 9 billion untapped market opportunity. Ibiza is a tech platform for insurance actors to unlock the agriculture insurance market worldwide. We design innovative weather-based index products and provide a platform to distribute and manage them in a cost-efficient and automated way. Our solution is based on three technological pillars, satellite earth observation, data analytics, and blockchain and has three main building blocks. The insurance product development, that is a platform for earth observation satellite data analysis, risk modeling and pricing. The policy distribution and management, this is the main platform used by our customers. And a remote and automated loss assessment. And this platform gives us a unique differ differentiator. Our current customers, are mutual insurers and organizations that reach more than half a million farmers uh, each. And each account has a potential of more than 1 million over a period of five years. We get paid a fixed amount for the use of the platform and a variable depending on the volume of policies. In addition, we charge a brokerage fee to their insurers as we are bringing them uh, new business and new markets. Incorporated in 2019, our main markets today are India, Philippines, and, and West Africa. We also work with one global company in the food sector and have uh, four customers in the pipeline. These are our five years uh, projections. And with just 16 partners, we can cover more than 5 million farmers. After two years in the market, we are ready to scale. And the bigger we get, the easier it is to scale and the better are the economies of the model. Also the value creation for all agriculture stakeholders. The European Space Agency, Draper Ventures and Consensus, leader in blockchain, are our main partners and investors. And we have a strategic partnerships with range shooters. The three founders, 
we come from very diverse professional backgrounds from a space industry, myself, blockchain to actuarial and insurance. We embark in this journey because of this uh, combined experience and execution capabilities to bring profitable solutions to this untapped market and uh, eventually contribute to change the world into a better place. My family is deeply rooted in agriculture. Annette has been her entire career in agriculture insurance. And Jean Baptiste is an actuary passionate about building the future of insurance using disruptive technologies uh, efficiently. And our motto is simple and efficient. We are the missing link in the market to enable value creation for farmers, insurance actors, global companies, and financial institutions. And uh, please uh, get in touch if you want to know more uh, about us. Thank you very much. All right, uh, that was, was, was even uh, below five minutes. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, let's uh, directly head to the questions. Uh, do you have some questions, guys? Um, yeah, M maybe I start with a very general question. Yeah. Um, so um, could you maybe uh, outline once again, what are the current obstacles in ensuring these farmers? Um, how, how is it probably currently it's not solved at all? Um, yeah, that would be interesting to understand. Yeah, so the, the main uh, obstacles are mainly cost driven. So the, there are three main costs, cost of administration, so back office, cost of distributing, so from the insurer to the uh, farmer, all this chain, and finally, the cost of loss assessment. And this is the biggest cost because today the way of assessing the loss is uh, indemnity based. So you have to go to the field and see the amount of yield that, uh, that, that uh, there is a loss. So that for a smallholder farmers that have a small plot of land and live in remote places, at the end it's more expensive to go there and to uh, assess the loss than the price of uh, what they pay. And that's why technology and especially parametric insurance and, and satellite uh, earth observation, they bring a disruption and uh, enable that these products can be cost efficient for the supply and uh, value for money for the demand. And um, what would be um, like like a rough estimate of um, of what farmers are willing or could could even pay? Like like I imagine the farmers, especially in the rural areas of, of developing countries, probably um, have um, no spare money at all. So th there is a global average of what the micro insurance for agriculture is based on uh, acquisition power. And this is between 15 and $20 per year. Okay. Mm -hmm. And also this uh, having uh, access to uh, insurance also gives access to credit. And uh, because there is a collateral to, uh, to let's say, uh, deal risk these uh, farmers. So the access to insurance is giving also access to other financial services and, and other services. May, may I ask why, um, so I understand you have a space tech angle by providing Copernicus and, um, um, and Galileo systems within your platform, right? Um, at the same time, um, I'm lacking to understand where the um, blockchain component is uh, providing a certain level of trust that is required by the participants in the value chain. Um, so could you please elaborate a bit more on the pain points faced by the farmers and the insurers? on why blockchain is a key and critical component to it? So blockchain today, I mean, based on the, the adoption and, and uh, countries uh, is not a critical aspect in the value chain of the farmer, let's say. Uh, it's not uh, exposed to the farmer. We use the blockchain today uh, for other things. So the first one is our loss assessment. In our loss assessment, we have the automated assessment based on the satellite data. And we have a second step validation because sometimes this data is uh, optical data. So is um, when there is so cloudy conditions, the quality of data is less good. So we have a, a crowd assessment platform. So uh, using the concept of uh, wisdom of the crowd, like uh, Augur or Gnosis. So it's like a crowd assessment concept with a community of people that assess. 
and then these communities uh, around a crypto or an economic model, a token model, where they win and earn, uh, win and lose reputation. So this system is governed by this uh, reputation token, and this is used in our loss assessment platform on Ethereum with ERC20. The second component is that uh, we work with reinsurance. I call it the upstream chain. <laughs> and this upstream chain, we have uh, reinsurance contracts that are parametric. So they are composed, also, so they need to, to get fit by oracles or will get fit by oracles. So on the upstream channel, we have a um, work with some reinsurers in uh, governing this reinsurance contract uh, with Corda and that the contract and the uh, parameters and the oracles are governed by smart contracts instead of by uh, paper emails and <laughs> calling them. So there is a downstream component that is the public blockchain used for this crowd uh, assessment and uh, one upstream that is the smart contract to govern the, the relationship with a reinsurance contract, which is always more complex. So it's uh, simplifying and, um, and making that everybody has the same information at the same time. And then over time, in our roadmap, we have that the, the policy management system, the back end of the policy management system will be also, will incorporate uh, smart contracts. And in the future, even we can carry on to the, to the farmers, uh, but for the time being, the, there is no, no really a need. And also it will be more a barrier than a support. But at the end, uh, blockchain is really a technology that fits with insurance because insurance is based on trust. So the more you can uh, automate uh, this trust, uh, the better, but it has to go along with uh, understanding on our customers. Yeah, I guess. Thanks. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. We have room for one more question. Yeah, I guess I, I get another uh, final question also relating to the, uh, the blockchain part of the platform. So, um, I mean, total addressable market is obviously hu huge here, um, but perhaps uh, uh, back to your uh, uh, answer on how you're integrating prediction market and the prediction market uh, component here. I mean, uh, that that um, part is obviously very uh, compelling, but it's also at the same time, uh, prediction markets are, are also inc incredibly complex and, and also uh, um, it's, it's hard for, for people to, it's very hard to understand for a lot of people. So, so how do you like incentivize? I mean, I think it's a good thing that, that, um, that you're using uh, Ethereum and th that uh, you're making use of Ethereum components here. And I think you definitely need, need to point this out in your presentation. Uh, um, but how do you, how do you like incentivize people to, to participate on, on, on your platform through pred prediction markets? So, I mean, I put the example of Agur and Yossi, that, that prediction market, we are not really prediction market, but we work more or less the same way. We have a community of people that contributes, uh, with, uh, monthly, uh, assessment and we have built a platform where we inject the data uh, and we display the data in a way that is easy to, we call it actionable data. So when uh, these assessors that we call watchers uh, start assessing, uh, they will see the different ways we display the data more in a visual way, a statistical way. And it's really done uh, easy uh, for them to assess. So they have to do one assessment per month uh, one one shot, one campaign, and it takes them 20 to 30 minutes. And uh, we have been growing with them and uh, we provide uh, training course so that they uh, learn uh, or improve uh, their skills on uh, satellite and earth observation. So we do monthly uh, trainings. We have a community, LinkedIn group is very active and we are growing every month a number of watchers on a 10% and we are growing a number of uh, assessments done in the same proportion. So people really enjoy uh, using their knowledge into a real life application because they are more technical, uh, let's say more um, professor type and, and now they see they can apply it to a real case. 
And at the same time, it's also learning about the blockchain uh, usability. We work, we have work a lot to make it uh, easy for them to, to use because they are not a blockchain savvy people. So uh, we have leverage uh, everything, uh, MetaMask and everything to make it all simple uh, and usable. And, and it's really uh, very well received. And we use this assessment to train our uh, machine learning models so that the idea is that we, uh, for the difficult cases, we train our algorithms with these inputs and then there is less case for them. And as we grow, this is scalable and, and cheaper than doing uh, uh, machine learning on every point on earth. So it's a win-win situation. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Then, uh, yeah, thanks for your pitch. Um, if you have any other questions, uh, feel free to follow up with Maria directly. Uh, Maria, thanks for your pitch. Um, mm -hmm. Second today would be Hugo from Minimap. Hugo, can you hear us? Yes, I can. One second. Just. Uh... Presentation up. Apologies, always happens, doesn't it? Hang on a second. No worries. Uh, your camera is also off, by the way. Yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm just finding. Sorry, I was just uh, brought out of thing trying to find my presentation. One second, so I was just. I can also take someone in front of you and then you just yes, go later. Yes, if you want, fine, sorry, yeah. that'd be great, okay. thank you. Yeah. Uh, Raphael, Raphael do, you want, do you want to go next? Raphael? Yes, hello everybody. Yeah, sure, uh, we can kick off. Perfect. So, thank you for being invited here and have a pitch. I'm going to show you today DoxyChain. Become a digital hero while working on documents with your team as easy as never before and everything backed by blockchain. So, who is creating this? We have a team of uh, young next generation developers from the Warsaw University. The project is based in Poland. So we have Gabriel Dimowski, our CEO. He's 25 under 25 Forbes listed, coming from the Warsaw Stock Exchange. We have our mastermind, Piotr Gelasko, who is responsible for the deep code and creating this with his know-how from building decentralized exchanges and also collaborating with corporates like Bosch. We have myself as a venture builder here out of from Berlin. And we also have our great business angel, Jacek Bajorek represents one of the most precious law firms in Poland, in Krakow, responsible for many IPOs, but also dealing with a lot of government uh, relations and cities. And we have 15 other amazing talents in sales, in development, also in marketing, who already like with us in the team in our office in Warsaw and creating this startup. So the problem we are going to solve is there is a huge lack of digital trust out there. So please, Ask yourself, what was the last time where you were forced to do something very precious, important for you, remotely? You could not meet the people, you needed to negotiate a contract, you needed to get a certificate, a last will, whatever. So all of that, millions of people had that now in the last months. So we are going to solve this pain. How? We set up the new normal for document workflows. With a B2B SaaS platform, uh, backed by tailored permission blockchain, very user focused. So the whole team was sitting there for more than 12 months and thought, what can be beautiful to just create, upload the document and then collaborate with customers and with teams together. And this is what we have done. So how does it work? Just invite people. It's all about that. Create smart heroes. You can use this inside of your customers. You can use this inside of your team for any purpose you have with any document you already have in your ecosystem. Very simple, full transparent. Kill email chains. DoxyChain is killing email chains. We thought like, what can we really uh, optimize in everyday's work? 
So stop asking for copies, for recents. Just see very transparent all the people you invited. You see exactly who is working on the document, and which status he is. It's super transparent, it's super beautiful, and it saves a lot of time for yourself. So what's the next thing? Choose amazing workflows. So we created just the workflows which we everybody of us has at home or in his office or on the way. But stay compliant. It's everything put into a smartphone or into a smaller basic application, but it's still compliant. We stick to AEDS directives from the European Union. We stick to PSD2 and to durable medium. You can create standards or you can just use your standards you have. You're completely free to do this. So again, just the three key features. Create smart heroes, invite people, work with them, transparent, kill all the side hustles, just focus on the business, and then stay compliant with, law with lawyers, with notaries, you can use it for everybody. So these are the trusted partners we have already. We are already live. Oracle is pushing us to the next level for corporate business. Walters Kluver is our affiliate sales partner. So next month, they're launching our product on their webpage and then reselling it across Europe. And we have many others who are already using our MVP because we are live since last summer June. So again, the target is legal entities, lawyers, notaries, SMEs, so small, medium enterprises, corporate clients. Corporate clients is a big thing. There are like huge processes which needs to be optimized. And then, but we see also global unicorns. Imagine Uber Eats, Lieferando, what high fluctuation the HR department needs to face as of drivers. And this everything can be digitalized in a beautiful way. The market is huge, 34 billion globally. In Europe, 10.25. We want to reach 0.84 million in the first year and then scale in the next five years with you together to 110 million in 26. The, the market itself is just doubling. So this is a great opportunity. We know our figures. The, you get a freemium in the first month when you onboard it. But then it's a valuable system. You pay 23 euros per user. And then we know also that we need to reach our break even with 1.3 million, which is like said to be between 12 and 18 months. We go live next month. And this is what we need for that. 3 million euros. We already burned 300,000. Now we go to the next level. We want to grow. We want to scale research and development. And this is why we seek investors to join our journey and to expand into Europe. So I'm inviting everybody, please build with us the new normal. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Rafael. Yeah. Thanks for the pitch. Any questions? Yeah. I, I guess I got a question. Um, uh, so you, you obviously uh, spend a lot of time focusing on this UX part and, and the flow and, and looks pretty neat from what I see but I, I got a question on, on on the blockchain part and um and from what I understand is so you're using a, a permission chain so I guess my question would be uh, I mean why not use use a a public blockchain here um why not build something uh on top of a, a public blockchain um, I mean, public blockchains, they offer this unique auditability and, and, and transparency. Um, so I guess that's, that's something, you know, to why not tap into this and, and why not benefit from, from like the, you know, this, this, these two unique uh, features or, or characteristics of public blockchains here. This was one of the first questions. Thank you for this with the founders were discussing while what protocol should we use for this? And there, the decision was to use Tendermint and also to make it first um, closed, private, and then see how we can make it public. So the idea is we are talking about a lack of digital trust. So we said we set up first a system. We are using blockchain. Why blockchain? For hashing the signatures and hashing the changes in the documents, just what is really needed, like as a new technical standard as never before. When this is set, when this is running and we, we, we showed credibility in the market and lawyers and notaries are really shifting their, their paperwork into this digital ecosystem, we have a thought for a later stage to build nodes with players in big institutions like big banks when they start to use it, they can be operated also as nodes. So we can build a trusted network. And once this, we have this level reached because we see that it's a little bit of market education as well with the compliance uh, departments at the corporates. Once this level is reached, we are open to open the network to go into public 
uh, based with with trusted partners and creating nodes of value. This is like long term. Yeah, we talk about like I think two to five years from now. Um, I understood your product um, as being DocuSign, just using DLT. Is that correct? And how do you distinguish yourself from DocuSign? I mean, that that is already as easy as it, as it can get, in my view. Right. Nice. Also, a very important question. DocuSign is a beautiful tool to signature to to sign something, but it gives not a workflow. So when you receive something from DocuSign, you get an email and then you are invited to sign something and then you have something like that. We have a completely different approach. This is a platform. So as a lawyer, I can use this. I can white label this and then I'm inviting. I create digital heroes. I'm inviting people to work on it, to negotiate it. I rather would say we are a hybrid of Google Docs plus DocuSign plus Dropbox plus a lawyer who is a notary who is checking you and, co and confirming that it's right. So this is the difference between a single feature like DocuSign and then a full workflow platform like DocsyChain. Okay, so, so you already have uh, some kind of, um, I mean, it, it's, it's probably not, 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 not a plugin for Microsoft Word or for Google Docs, but you have your full-fledged um, Word editing um, yeah, feature also implemented. Exactly, that's very important. So you can use your existing Word documents and upload them. We have a plugin and uh, you can rather use your template because the first users we have now are lawyers in Poland who want just to digitalize their everyday work. And then we have some templates where you can just create a durable medium. There are some EU regulations. Uh, if you want to send something to the court or you want to sign your last will, then you can just use our templates based on durable medium. Yeah. So both works, own documents or, um, or standardized features. Um, so understanding what you've just said, that uh, your key differentiators from uh, HelloSign or DocuSign, um, who easily could also integrate blockchain and might uh, also offer document workflow um, um, solutions in the future. Um, what else are the key um, pain points of uh, corporate clients at the moment? I mean, for uh, based on my knowledge, at least, uh, one key reason for not using DocuSign at the moment is that they don't want to have the documents stored on the cloud. Um, so how do you tackle that? Right. So indeed, this is the, the standard pitch because all the corporates, they are now integrating DocuSign or Adobe Sign or any other uh, system which is out there. So uh, the pitch is very simple. We have two, uh, maybe I can, like we have talks to companies like Uber Eats and Lieferando. They already implemented something like DocuSign, but still they need to have manual processes and the people who are like signing it, it's like still a hustle in terms of like a lot of side steps next to it. So with that, our use case, uh, they are onboarding this. They're the user, for example, who wants to sign an HR contract, the new employee onboarded is also receiving a message and then he can just store it and he can sign it and also negotiate it. I think the negotiation part is quite critical because you are going in there and as you see here in the middle, you can see the status of the persons, what they actually do. You can assign roles. And this is like the strong additional USP, which we um, present and we then implement against DocuSign or just single off point signature solutions. You create, we call it create smart digital heroes. And uh, a hero is like a person who is amazing. And once people are here on the system, they stick to it and then they started to use it as a new normal, as a new standard. And then there are so many features out there with uh, document management. And this is the team who was sitting just and thought how we can improve this process, how we can make it as beautiful that my mom or my brother, with full respect to my brother, um, uh, he's very young, that he can just use it yeah, uh, from right from the stage. All right, thanks. Then, uh, yeah, we have room for one more question. Otherwise, I would uh, switch to the next startup. Thank you, Rafael. Thanks, Andre. Thank you. Uh, yeah, the next one, uh, Hugo, shall we, uh, shall we try another time? Yes, apologies for that. Thank you for that. No worries. Um, no cool. Worries, let, let me share. Let me share my screen. Rafael, can you stop your uh, screen? I think, I think I've done that. I think I've, is that working now? Yeah, now it works, yeah. 
Okay, Jessica. perfect. Excellent. So um, thank you for um, having us. Um, I'm introducing um, Minima. My name's Hugo Feiler. I'm co-founder and CEO at Minima. I'm also joined by Paddy, who is the co-founder and CTO as well, um, for answering technical questions. So um, Minima is a layer one protocol, a public chain with a clearly defined go-to-market strategy to drive, mass, to drive mass adoption. You may be thinking there are already enough layer one protocols out there, but layer one protocols are the fair and foundation upon which everything else is going to get built upon. So we believe it is vital that we build the most resilient and foundation possible. As a layer one protocol, Minima is completely unique. The world's first truly mobile native blockchain. This is not about a light client or a crypto wallet on a mobile. This is about an entire blockchain running in full on a mobile. We see this as the natural, natural next step for blockchain from desktop to mobile just like the step change from digital to broadband. And most importantly, mobile native means that this does not require centralized servers or data centers to function, just user devices. Blockchain protocols were designed to be decentralized to create resilience, but Minima is the only layer one protocol that delivers on that goal to be and remain completely decentralized. And this is because on Minima, every user will be an equal of our SIM app download, using no more energy or space than a regular messaging app. Minima does not rely on miners, stakers, or central servers, because as soon as you create interdependency and one party is reliant on another, you create misalignments and conflicting agendas, which over time will become points of weakness. So, Minima is building the most accessible and resilient public network for value transaction in the world, and we plan to prove this within the year. We're allocating 30% of the coin supply to an extensive incentive scheme to grow our node count 25,000 by mainnet and 500,000 a year later. And for any other protocol, this would seem an impossible dream, but our only ask of people is for them to download an app and keep it running and to start earning their coins. To put this into context, um, that that um, 20, um, 25,000 coins, uh, 25,000 nodes is more than double the number that Bitcoin has. And unlike most layer one protocols, we have a clear go to market strategy to drive early adoption by the telecom industry. The telcos have the users and Minima can give the telcos a solution that will help re uh, reposition them to ensure their continued relevance. So the moment the, the networking problem, the existing legacy back end accounting infrastructure has been built up over 30 years and is no longer fit for purpose. This complicated system has many challenges, including snow, slow speed to market, billing inaccuracies, fraud, and the need for manual workarounds, all of which stifle innovation. <clears throat> Minima's um, tokenization solution. So with every node running on every customer, with a node running on every customer's phone, Minima creates a direct transactional link between the telco and their customer. And unlike many new technologies, Minima does not require existing technology to be replaced. Normally, new servers would need to be installed, but with Minima, uh, mobile, devi with Minima mobile devices and their users become the servers, making the system self-powering. So how do telcos unlock value? Once Minima has installed the tokens and the, uh, has been installed and the tokens have been issued, the telcos can offer a range of valuable features enabling users to buy, sell, share data, earn rewards, make purchases, get access to medical services, manage their identity, and much more. This is about driving acquisition by attracting non-network users to enhanced experience. This is about driving loyalty because the volume of benefits from being on a tokenized network carries a bond, um, creates a bond between the user and the service, which is emotionally and financially difficult to cut, and driving incremental revenue because Minima's tokenization will enable a wide range of enterprise partnership opportunities from IoT and healthcare through to retail and um, utilities, all of which positively impact the telcos. And we're seeing very good traction within the sector. In 2019, Swisscom ran a court code audit and testnet across three continents. Our first POC with UK-based Manx Telecom saw tokens being sent from one phone to another, granting network access without touching any of the operator's existing systems. And over the next two months, we'll be starting two pilots around converged wallets and loyalty programs. The first with Africa's largest telco, MTN, will be piloting it in Nigeria, and they have 63 million customers. And the second pilot is with the 
with um, CK Hutchinson that owns the three network across Europe and has 100 million customers. As a team, we are currently 15. Uh, my background is 20 years in marketing communications. I was general manager at Marcom, at Mark, for Marcoms at Sony and have founded and um, uh, run globally awarded advertising agencies. My, Paddy, uh, my co-founder, Paddy, um, CTO, is a 10x uh, full stack coder with 20 years of coding experience. He fell down the rabbit and um, the blockchain rabbit hole in 2012. Steve, our lead core developer, has been coding for 30 years and has a PhD in blockchain. Brendan, one of our telco advisors, was the CIO at Telefonica for nine years. And Mike was the CTO at Manx Telecom, where we carried out our first POC with the team. And he's now joined us as the technical advisor overseeing our telco integrations. In terms of timing, we've been building since 2018, and we're due to launch our mainnet at the end of Q3 this year. We're in the middle of a private round at the moment, and we'll be starting our outreach to developers, initially via the 1.2 million strong global, global Java user groups, as well as our node running incentive program, aimed not just at crypto fans, but um, at mobile phone users in general. Thank you. That's us. Fantastic. Thanks for the pitch, Hugo. Uh, yeah, do we have some questions? Did I get it right that um, the entire blockchain is stored on every single device? Um, how, um, how do you calculate um, device storage capacities and, um, and the, the data that needs to be stored on the device and every um, user's phone in the long run? Yeah. Paddy, do you want to go to that? Yes, why, why don't I chip in there? Hi, hi there. Uh, yeah, Minima uses um, an innovative system. So instead of storing the massive 500 gigabyte database that Bitcoin has or the four terabyte database that Ethereum has, this is clearly not going to work on a mobile phone. We use a proof DB, a proof database, which runs on MMR technology. What this means is that I look after my coin and you look after yours. And then when I send my transaction, I add a proof to that transaction that allows everybody on the network to check the validity of those coins. The only thing everybody on the network has to store is the root of a, a kernel of information, the root of the entire tree, and all the users look after their own coins. What's really nice about this is that it's lossless. So we have exactly the same amount of information as if everybody was storing everything. Um, but actually everybody only has to store them, frankly, an infinitesimally small amount of data compared to everybody storing everything. Um, and this has meant that we basically have a database size of about 10 megabytes. Um, and that doesn't grow because you only look after your coins and you, you know, present the proof at point of sale when you send the transaction. Uh, and it's working really nicely, very efficient. And, um, and can you can you also highlight a bit more why a user um, has an incentive to actually run Minima on his uh, mobile phone? So uh, yes, absolutely. There um, are certain use cases which um, I could imagine in the long run, but therefore you have to see a certain traction that users are actually seeing and observing the possibilities provided by the Minima uh, by Minima uh, capability. The object of Minima is to make it so simple and efficient to run an entire blockchain on your phone that the user won't actually be involved in, and obviously, you know, in any of the low-level decisions. They may not even know that they're running a blockchain. Um, the fact that Minima is mobile native means that installing it is as simple as going to the app store, clicking download, boom, it's on your phone. It's exactly the same as installing WhatsApp. The difference is that instead of being an information transfer layer like WhatsApp, we do the value transfer layer. So as far as the user is concerned, it's just another application that they install. Um, the fact that it's so simple and the fact that it's so small means that they never have to ask anybody for anything. We don't outsource any of the security. We don't ask as a minimum user, I am completely in charge of my coins. I am a full validating and full constructive node, by which I mean, that every single user on the minimum network is involved in the construction of the chain as well as the full validation. I completely agree that this is way beyond the technical capacity of 99.999% of users, but they don't need to know that. What matters is that they can install this application simply and that they can use it to do all the lovely you know, things that we know you can do on blockchain. So value transfer, tokens, smart contracts, decks, et cetera, et cetera. 
um, all of this is just derivative stuff that pops out. And especially now that the telcos are getting interested and they're using it for tokenizing different aspects of their network. So you have a megabyte of data, you have some SMS, you have airtime. Um, the user doesn't even really know that that is happening. The reason it's so good is because it's so efficient in comparison to the old legacy systems that the telcos can offer a better service cheaper. So the user will naturally say, okay, I can use the old system, it costs me 10 cents a minute, or I can use the new system, it costs me eight cents a minute. They're gonna use the cheaper system. Yeah? So it doesn't actually matter whether the user knows that they're using a blockchain system or not. The point is it would be far more efficient than the current system. Um, and clearly there's all the other you know, nice things that you can do that we all use on Ethereum and Bitcoin, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you get full access to that as well. So why wouldn't you? A quick question from the audience. Uh, what's the difference between Minima and um, the uh, Mina uh, protocol? Uh, yes, that's a good question. Um, the CODA, which is now called Minima protocol, um, is actually the same as the old system. So I call them miner centric. There are still miners in Mina. Um, and what they do is they create these very small uh, zero knowledge recursive proofs that they give to a user to prove the state of the chain, which means that each user can actually validate the chain when they send them transaction. Minima is better than this because what Minima does is it allows the users themselves to be involved in the construction of the chain. And frankly, this is the most important bit. Uh, the security of a blockchain is only its ability to resist censorship attacks. This is only done by the miners, the only people who are involved in that part of the security, which is the only value proposition of the blockchain, are the miners. Running a full node is excellent, and you must obviously do that, in my opinion, um, but it plays no part in preventing censorship. I can't force a miner to add a transaction to a block. And this is the issue. In Minima, that is not an issue because every user is involved in the creation of the blocks. Um, so this is the fundamental difference between uh, Minima and Coda. There are other differences, such as the fact that Minima is complete. Minima is finished. It is a protocol at 1.0. And to achieve that, we have to be quantum secure. Since in the next 10, 20 years, that is going to rear its head. You know, once humanity sets its mind on something, it achieves it. And so those computers are going to be, you know, available pretty soon. We see it already. Uh, unfortunately, zero knowledge proofs are not quantum secure. Uh, so in 10 or 20 years, that's really not going to work. Um, you're going to have to switch to a different system, which is in the works, and that's fine. Um, and we will be able to uh, velvet port that in at that stage. So... Um, there are fundamental technical differences, but the main one is a paradigm shift between the idea that most blockchains are run on a two-tier system where you have those who run the chain and those who use the chain. That's not going to work for me. I need to be part of the chain as an equal. Everybody on the minimum network runs exactly the same software in the same way with the same settings. We are all part of it. Um, and this creates the most decentralized, hence the most resilient, hence the most censorship resistant blockchain in existence. Okay, thanks. Uh, we, we're a bit in time pressure. Emmanuel, do you still have a quick question or, or can we otherwise we move on? I think my question has been answered. I, I wanted to, uh, to, to ask something along the lines of security, but I think we got uh, pretty much covered here. Okay, awesome. Yeah, then uh, thanks, Patrick. Thanks, Igor. And uh, let's move to our last pitch for today, uh, which is uh, Anchal from uh, Spherium Labs. Can you hear us, Anchal? You still need to unmute yourself. Am I audible now? Yes. Okay. Yes, can see your presentation as well. Fantastic. Okay. okay. So, um, hi everyone. I'm Anjil. I'm CIO and CSO of Swarium Finance. So, Swarium Finance is um, a decentralized and borderless. We are actually trying to create a borderless financial system. 
we are in the space of decentralized financing and we are trying to create an all-in-one solution which will be able to solve all the current issues which are there in the DeFi ecosystem. So um, whoever is there in the space of blockchain and is aware of the decentralized financing solutions, they must be aware that it is really uh, decentralized finance has the capability to make bring in huge changes in the way finance works right now. It's a revolutionary system because it's decentralized, it's permissionless, and it eliminates the needs of banks and financial institutions as, middle, uh, as middlemen. But the major concern that we saw uh, in this space is that the system is not easy to use for any layman. So if you see the current um, ecosystem, it's growing exponentially. It's a trillion dollar market right now. Um, a total value logged as uh, a few days back was 40 billion and it is growing regularly. But when we still talk about the growth potential, uh, the traditional financial ecosystem is still very huge. And the major reason those institutional investors, those institutions and laymen are not coming into the ecosystem are because it's not very easy. You, you can use a banking mobile app very easily, a banking, internet banking very easily. You don't have to actually teach anyone how to use them. It's very easy to go and do a transaction, to uh, send money, to receive money, to um, uh, borrow, to lend. The system is streamlined. But current DeFi ecosystem, when we see the projects like Uniswap or when we see um, Compound or Aave, it's not very simple. Very few people, a very small percentage of the whole population is able to actually utilize it. And the lack of KYC or the, the lack of KYC or any kind of oversight in the ecosystem makes it all the more difficult for institutional players to use DeFi for their needs. So what we are trying to solve is that we want to unify the DeFi landscape. So we are bringing, creating one ecosystem where you'll have swap, lending, borrowing, staking, and wallet. So when we talk about wallet, it is going to be a mobile application, which will not be an aggregator, just like or Frontier Wallet or any other aggregator, but it will be a complete ecosystem where we, so our ecosystem will be there on mobile as well as web. We'll have a better rewarding mechanism so that traders as well as stakers are rewarded as for, we are also building a cross-chain interoperable system. So we have, uh, what has not been mentioned in this slide and which is very important to be um, mentioned is that we are building um, Sperium Finance on Binance Smart Chain and Ethereum plus Polygon uh, at the same time. And we are trying to build the ecosystem so it's in a, such a manner that it is highly scalable. It, is, it has very less gas fee and it is multi-chain compatible. So we have in cross-chain interoperability, we have low gas fee and instant transactions. Um, and th these are the major things that we are trying to solve here. Um, the ecosystem that we are trying to build in has Hyperswap, Square Comp with cross-chain interoperability and our Sparium wallet. And in the middle of all these um, different components is our SPH token which will be used for all the, in all these particular parts of the ecosystem. So um, when we try, when we see Binance, for example, Binance may be centralized, but the major reason it is growing so big and so becoming big and big every day is because it is a complete ecosystem. There are many, many exchanges right now, but none of them is as big as Binance. The reason being their BNB token has so much of a utility right now it is being used for Binance Smart Chain. Is it's used in Binance system? They have their own. Um, they have their credit cards, debit cards. So on uh, fiat on ramp, off ramp is possible. They have uh, coin market cap. A number of acquisitions all over the world. So it has. It is a complete ecosystem. So what we are trying to do here is create an ecosystem where everything can be available at in one platform and one token for use for everything. That reduces cost, that reduces the and improves the user experience, and it makes the life of the people using DeFi space much, much easier. 
because they are not they are not worried to own different tokens for different facilities which are required to be done we are uh, developing our product in two phases phase 1 which will have swap lending and wallet in uh, and plus our sph governance token is almost 90% completed we are working on the front end right now and phase 2 will bring in cross chain interoperability synthetics vault spare portfolio spare locks and there are many other also um, things that we are also working on right now which are in research so uh, the the our platform is in com- uh, continuous evolving we are continuously evolving the system based on what is happening in the ecosystem we started last year in april our research started in april 2020 and in january or february 2021 we have brought in lot more features based on how the technology is evolving um our wallet uh, we j- just just some more words about the wallet that we are trying to create here um, as i have already mentioned that this wallet will not be an aggregator rather it will have all complete functionality plus we'll have um, um i mean we'll be able to bring in applications like trust wallet metamask coinbase and other web3 based mobile wallets also will be accessible using this wallet um again uh, as i mentioned that sph token will be used for all the uh, applications which are going to be built as a part of the platform so it is a multi purpose built native token which will be used for accessing various defi applications in our roadmap if you see um we have completed our website we have completed our swap backend we have completed our staking rewards and lending to an extent the only uh, thing pending right now is our front end which uh, we are expecting to complete in march and uh, going ahead we are going to build our layer 2 solution um and we are going to build their various layers so we are trying to build each and every product as a top layer um, on basis or on on top of our platform so um again we have completed our ui ux um our architecture development our research web our website version 1.0 is live 80% of mvp is done it's just a um, the repetition again i think so we have 100 million tokens in total we have divided them into mostly so we have we are spending uh, we have kept most of the tokens for ecosystem development so 25 24% of the total tokens will be used for ecosystem development and 18% for liquidity rewards and protocol emissions um we have also kept about 15% of the tokens for marketing legal and admin expenses and uh, we have about 10% tokens for seed round and 16% for private sale public distribution we have mentioned it here as 2% um initially it will be 1% which will be going out in public sale and 1% will be the liquidity that we will add in the ecosystem so if you see the current market um we we don't have a complete ecosystem as a competitor so we try to find out what are the various components which can be considered as our competitors so uniswap has a current valuation of i think uh, it is not even but 5 billion it is reaching about 9 billion right now compound has 1.2 billion valuation frontier wallet is also more than 500 million right now so and this is uh, how these particular components are performing right now being first to market and they all have their own uh issues like uniswap is very costly with the uh, rising costs of ethereum um frontier wallet is again an aggregator and it does not have a a, a, a system to generate revenue i should say compound is very good again very high cost and uh, but when you compare it to sterium our seed sale valuation we have kept as 11 million and at the time of token generation event only 10% of the tokens will be out so our valuation will be less than will be about 2.5 million at the time of token generation event so if you see we have kept ourselves very reasonably priced very very low price so that the investors can get very good return on their investment um so these are some of the numbers that we have put in that we have uh, 10 million 10% or 10 million of our tokens for available for seed round 16 million for private sale and 1 million for public sale rounds um the prices have been kept as 11 cents and 11 cents 17 cents and 25 cents respectively 
So and uh, we have uh, a longer vesting period for all for seed and private sale rounds. So um, it is not mentioned in this slide, but I would still like to explain on the vesting side of the things. So we have very long term plans because the product is going to keep on evolving. We are trying to build a whole ecosystem in DeFi space. So um, we have a longest vesting for a foundation tokens, which is which is about four and a half years. For even for team, it is more than two years. For private sale investors, the invest uh, the investing is about one year, and for seed sale investors, it is more than one and a half year. So we want to get actually uh, partners, not just investors, because as you know, in such a market which we are in such a bull market, raising a few million is not difficult. What is important is that we sh we really want to get partners who help us grow in the long run because our focus is not just getting retail adoption but also the untapped institutional adoption in the DeFi space so uh, there we really want to get in touch with organizations which can help with the partnerships and also reaching out to institutional investors um, then if you see the core team uh, it is our ceo is mr alex bernstein bernstein and he is from germany and he's a multi munich based it data security and startup business specialist and attorney he has been in this space for quite long and has been uh, involved in the space of defi and blockchain uh, for at least last 3 years sash who's our ceo is a london based investor advisor and he has been in the defi space since 2014 he has been investing in multiple startups and he has been in the space of finance for a very long time now um myself i am um, CIO and CSO at Sperium Finance. I am a chartered accountant by qualification. So my expertise lies in IT uh, space and in banking space because I've worked in IT for in one of the biggest um, IT service providers in India as a um, banking consultant. Uh, if we have our CTO, which who uh, care, he is a researcher. Um, we, we, we're running a little bit short on time. I'm really sorry. Sure, <laughs> Do we, sure. uh, can, I think can I'll, we run, I'll just... Run? Yeah, I think we'll just, this was actually the last slide only. <laughs> so, okay, perfect. Yeah. Cool. And maybe can you, again, because uh, I think DeFi is also a very blockchain specific space. Not everyone is a blockchain expert uh, in this room here today. Can you maybe quickly like sum up in two or three sentences again, like what's the, the punchline of, you know, the product you're building and what problem you're solving with it? We, uh, I would say just in one sentence, we are, if you uh, people here are aware of Binance or maybe the ecosystem, the blockchain ecosystem, Binance is one of the biggest players. So we are trying to build Binance of DeFi. So, uh, but decentralized, of course. So okay. um, our focus is to build an all-in-one solution, which is very low cost and highly scalable. All right. Thank you, Anshan. Then, uh, yeah, that's also a few few minutes for questions for you, and then we uh, sum, sum, sum everything up. So, uh, any questions from the jury side so far? Yeah, I can go first. Um, that's okay. So, I got a question for uh, Anshan. Um, so, um, I'm just trying to understand um, ba based on your uh, presentation. So, so DeFi is this, you know, is in its third or fourth year now, and, and I guess it's it's got all the the cool and, and really well really well conceived uh, and widely used battle tested uh, features um, and, and a lot of dApps obviously and protocols um, and and you know they're they're all out there you know what people call composability or or money legos and, and so my question is I, I guess is why not focus on just like one one element or one of those DeFi um, subcategories and, and, and build like on, on top of what's already there. Um, so, so and, and then focus on, on just one thing uh, because there's a lot of good stuff out there already. Um, and and um, it, it just sounds like a lot of stuff, you know, it's, it's that you're building is, it's, 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 it's it just sounds to me, it sounds like a lot of stuff. So, um, yes. Yeah, actually, thanks for this question, Manuel. Actually, we have got this question from um, someone earlier also asked the same question that why are we building so many uh, things right now? So you see, the fact is that we already have Uniswap, we have SushiSwap, we have PancakeSwap, we have um, many systems or um, we have um, Compound, Aave already in place. But 
when as a uh, user if you'll go and try to use them it's not very easy ui ux and experience if if a person wants to goes to a bank they get all the facilities at one place they don't have to go to one place for depositing their money or staking uh, and another place to buy something and third place to lend or borrow money it should be actually in one place and when we talk about the aggregators they those aggregators are also working on one just like this the way that you asked working on one particular pain point everyone is creating just one product and if you create only one product it is always going to be difficult for an average user to come in and use the platform and second point is that when we talk about institutional adoption institutions do not prefer to use uh, um uniswap or any uh, vault solutions which are available right now because uh, all of them are people just create those, those protocols and um, then there are some developers who are working on it there is no one platform which is responsible for a lot of things which is first of all doing kyc d5 people don't prefer to do kyc at all and uh, we might get a flag for bringing in that kyc element but without kyc we know we might get trouble into the, the platform might get into trouble at some point of time in future when sec or the organizations of, or maybe regulators in different countries might start looking at things and what is happening in these spaces so we didn't want to uh, become an aggregator and because that adds a layer of one more token increases the price on top of the exponential prices which are already there for the transactions and reduces the speed also of the transactions because you have to go from one point to another point to another point so there are multiple transactions happening in case you are doing an aggregator so we didn't we are trying to solve the these major problems that we want to be fast we want to be cheap and we want to have everything in one place benefit of having these particular components already being built is and they because they are open source we have been able to take their code base we have been able to utilize their solidity code create a fork in some cases and build on top of it so that increases the speed of development but our vision of creating an all in one solution which is fast which is cheap also gets done so we might not take as much time as uh, uniswap to develop into this product because uh, or maybe even if you see pancake swap so it's again another swap solution only but there are fork of uniswap built on binance smart chain and they're scaling up so much that they've surpassed uniswap also within a span of i think through 2 to 3 months so we are doing the same thing we are trying to build another solution which which is more comprehensive moving from one point to another like from lending borrowing staking to um, swap will not be difficult for people once they get a hang of it of the platform because they'll have everything at one place and we are trying to simplify the things by making uh, it accessible using single token same platform similar kind of uh, navigations i hope i'm able to explain thank you okay yeah uh, any last follow up question or so far so good okay looking good okay then uh, yeah thanks for your pitch uh, and um, let's take a minute quickly so i would ask the jury uh, i send you guys yesterday a link for um, evaluation sheet for today um so right now please take your time to fill it up i saw marcel already completed it thanks a lot um and at the same time jan can you please um activate the uh, uh, the polling function for the audience so to everyone in the audience uh we have a live um voting function so you can uh, decide which startup today you think uh, uh, you found the, the most promising and uh, we will count the votes from the audience and from the jury in total 50-50 and announce a monthly favorite so we take a minute and then we can conclude In the meantime, if you're already done and you still have some questions, then feel free to. Sagar, do you have questions from your side, maybe? Ah, uh, good. Thanks. Okay. Cool.
All right. Audience, audience vote is pretty clear. Then let's wait for one more jury member. I guess I jump, have to jump in here. Sorry, I, uh, I don't have the uh, sheet available right now. Could you resend Wait. it, please? Uh, yeah, of course, of course, of course, of course. Give Thank me a second. You. I think I sent my last email to yesterday, but just- I got my check. grading done already. I uh, just need to fill it in. Okay, 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 no worries. Uh, you get it in a second. Uh, yeah, I sent it out again to you right now uh, to your to email. Check if you received it. I like the polling feature, but it doesn't actually give you any user feedback when you click on something. I don't know if everybody else has noticed that. You can't tell if it's, you know, when you click on them. Yeah, so much for the Zoom discussion we had in the beginning today, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so just little things, little things make all the difference. Yeah, 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 we're a little bit restricted. Like, so the co-hosts, they can see the results, actually. So if you can see the results, it's because you are a co-host. Normal participants uh, cannot, cannot see the results. And so last uh, yeah, opportunity as soon as, to vote. Yeah, last opportunity. And as soon as Manuel is done, we can conclude. Did you receive the uh, phone, Manuel? Got it now, yeah. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, cool. So as soon as we announce someone, um, we will write like um, a quick article and we'll share it through our news, through our channels, and uh, also happy to make some intros. So to the startups, um, feel free to reach out to us after if you would like to have uh, intros to some some of the VCs or someone else. Happy to happy to connect you. Uh, it was a bit longer today than 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 expected, uh, but uh, I hope it was still. Uh, Educating enough, everyone. Okay. Um, yeah, so results are pretty clear. Uh, first place for today is uh, Minima. Uh, was uh, awarded uh, four from the audience and uh, jury is a, is a close call, but uh, yes, first place. So congratulations to Hugo and Patrick. Thanks for your time. Thanks for your preparation. Thanks to everyone else, especially to the jury. So, uh, um, Yanis, uh, Marcel, and Manuel, thanks a lot for your time and for being here today. Highly appreciate it. And uh, yeah, reach out to all of you guys uh, soon again and hope to see most of you again for our next event, which will be in exactly one month, end of March, for our next monthly pitch up, uh, pitch event. So, thanks everyone. Uh, and last word, as always, uh, goes to Jan from Disrupt. <laughs>